Hey everyone, welcome back to this very special edition of the HeelCast, and we have a very special guest lined up, but it's not this guy. <laughs> Raven Effect, are you here? Uh, what are, the hell are you talking about, man? Every time the RAV shows up, it's a special occasion. I know, he's not supposed to show up that much, buddy. Not anymore, man. Not not recently. We uh, should maybe apologize to everyone for you know not doing a show in forever, but uh, it's because this was kind of in the making and we just had shit to do. That's right. So, but you are excited for this, right? Yeah, I've been uh, flipping balls since this announcement got made a couple weeks ago, trying to hold this one in, but uh, you know, yeah, I'm fucking stepped. Well, I know you're excited for a special guest, and so am I. But before we get to that. It's time to get to the man himself, my buddy Griggs. How's it hanging, bro? What's going on, guys? Glad to be here, and it's a new record for me, I think. Wait, Griggs isn't the special guest? This is what I was excited for. I know. Tell <laughs> me about it, right? So, you guys, you ready to do this? Yeah, we're ready. All right. Well, look, guys, then without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, if we can call you that, we give you none other than the Canadian destroyer himself, Petey Williams. Petey. Welcome to the HeelCast. Oh, how's she going, eh? <laughs> that, that's that's my new uh, thing I'm trying to get going. Don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'm, I'm giving it a try. Hey, it's working for me, and you might have to get <laughs> used to it with some of these Canadian tapings coming up. <laughs> I, I, I bet. I'm going to have to. I think that's going to catch on more than because Stone Cold said so. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have something like a Scott Hall that people are waiting for him to say his hey yo line. Yeah, something like that. I don't. Who knows if it's gonna catch on? I'll give it a hey, shot. Just twenty on years the later, oh, twenty that? years later, my brother he never greased me without saying, "Hey, hey yo." It's hey, been twenty exactly. years. Exactly. Exactly. So why not this be like be a thing that catches on? And you know, a lot of Canadians already say it, but what if Americans start saying it? How would that revolutionize, like, you know, the world? Pretty much. I I think it would be epic. Canada yeah. takes on the world. I have no idea how that'd go over, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not working for you, Raven Effect. So, yeah, Petey, before we get into this, we understand that you have your own wrestling podcast. You want to tell the uh, heel casters about it. And, and more importantly, where can they find it so they can tune in to you every week as well? Uh, yeah, I'd, so I have my own uh, podcast. It's, uh, it's called The Wrestling Perspective. You can uh, find us. Uh, we have our own website, thewrestlingperspectivepodcast.com. And I do it with uh, a great guy, Dennis Farrell. He used to, um, he's actually, I, I call him, I don't know if he refers to himself as one, but I call him a professional podcaster. See, all of us right now, we're just, I, I feel we're amateurs. But the reason why he's professional is because he used to uh, work for uh, ESPN doing their fantasy football. He's big into that. And right now he uh, he does like like Ford Motor Company. He does uh, one of their podcasts. Like that's what he legit gets paid for. I, I've been in his office. It's like tremendous and stuff right downtown, right next to, uh, Cobo Hall, which is right next to the Joe Louis Arena downtown Detroit. Um, but I mean, you know, we talk about we've never had a guest on. Um, we we talk about uh, current stuff, maybe some old stories. Uh, you know, w whatever we want to talk about, we do like absolutely no show prep. So um, I, we could probably be a little bit more professional, but uh, it's good, and I love doing it. We've been doing it since probably. I don't know if he asked me to do it in February or if we started doing it in February, but it's 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 been a while now, and uh, it was it was before I came back to TNA and all that stuff, and uh, yeah, we 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 really enjoy it. And if anybody wants to listen to it, that's where you can find it: wrestlingperspectivepodcast.com. dot com. Yeah, I, we appreciate you pushing that out there, man. And Dennis has been fantastic with us. He's the one that uh, hooked us up with you. Uh, how did you and Dennis get uh, get set up together anyway? How'd they get started? Oh, a long time ago after I left TNA uh, the first time, uh, probably like in 2009, um, I started uh, you know, working at a gym and I started managing this gym. And uh, uh, I, I met a guy, uh, he was one of my, my clients and uh, really cool dude. And then he, uh, like we went out for drinks and stuff like that. You're not supposed to go out for like drinks with your client or whatever, but he was a really cool dude. And he says, hey, I, I, you know, can I bring my buddy Dennis? And I'm like, all right, who's this Dennis guy? And then you know, he was a wrestling fan. Uh, more so than the guy that I, I used to train. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we just shot the breeze. We hit it off and stuff like that. And our, our mutual friend, his name was Adam. He's actually long gone. He lives in uh, Texas. I think he's like a police officer or something now. And uh, 
I remember Dennis coming to, I invited him to like my daughter's like second birthday or something at my old place and all that stuff. And then we kind of lost touch for a little bit because our mutual friend was gone. And then one day he texted me out of the blue and I was, I remember I had the flu. Like I was not texting him back. I was like in between like dry heaves pretty much. And then I texted him back the next day and he kind of made a joke like, Hey, uh, you know, why are you waiting so long to text me back or whatever? And then he just said, Hey man, I got an idea. You want to do a, a wrestling podcast? And you know, I'll tell you the truth. I hemmed and hawed about it for a while. Cause I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that commitment, all that kind of stuff. Long story short, he talked me into it and that's where we're at now. And he goes to like a lot of local indie shows. He goes to with me. Um, you know, he's even met Demore. him and Demore hit it off and everything. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, we're inseparable now. It's almost like we're dating, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dennis has been a real cool guy to us. Uh, again, Dennis, thank you for uh, setting this up for us and for actually listening to our show. And I, I had no idea. So, Dennis, like, um, I got to pick your brain and talk some fantasy football with you one day, too. That's my thing as well. So, yeah, no, he's really, I mean, that's one Pretty thing. Awesome I, think that's what, I think that's why he likes me, is because I don't pick his brain about fantasy football. Um, like we never, ever, ever talk football. Like, I think I, one time I brought up an analogy, uh, like comparing football to wrestling. I don't know what the analogy was, but I was like, yeah, you know that guy. And he's like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Move on. Like he doesn't even want to talk about football on the, on our wrestling perspective podcast. So yeah, that's, that's probably why we hit it off. So I actually don't know that I necessarily want to say I want to pick his brain because I feel like I'm like a, an expert myself too. I'm probably like nowhere near it, but I mean, it's, you know, that kind of thing. So Dennis, I'm not trying to like get advice from you. I'm just saying bullshit sometimes. Uh, I'm just saying Raven Effect. I remember last year when you beat me on the very last play of the very last game of the season. And I never played before, so you might need a little bit more Dennis's <laughs> advice than you think so, buddy. I'm just saying. All right. Now, now look, Petey. We understand uh, you know, some news over the last couple of weeks that uh, Jeff Jarrett has last left the company. This is obviously something that the heel casters have been talking a lot about. Uh, you know, what are your feelings on uh, Jeff having left the company? Uh, and would you like to see him come back? Um, well, my feelings about, well, you got to remember when I first started in TNA in 2004, um, Damore like had just started being an agent down there. He got like Chris Saban down there. And then they wanted to do this whole, like, uh, I, I, at the time they were doing, like, Team Mexico versus Team TNA. And they were like, hey, Scott, how about you put together Team Canada? And he's like, yeah, sure. And, you know, they pitched me. And uh, they're like, oh, we don't know this guy, you know. And, like, let, let's use, like, Teddy Hart and, like, uh, British Bulldogs kid. Like, they, they didn't want to have me. And I think what got me in is, like, uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr., like, he had to finish his exams or something, couldn't make the tapings. And they're like, who's this PD guy again? And they were like, yeah, you know, and like describe him to us. He's like, uh, you know, he, he's pretty Jack like pitcher buff Bagwell got thrown into a dryer. And then while he was in the dryer, he learned how to work. And then, so <laughs> I know that, that, that kind of popped the, uh, the creative team. They're like, all right, let's bring him in. And, uh, you know, everything just worked out like really perfect. Um, I, I, I did the Canadian destroyer at one of the TV tapings and then, it was Jeff's idea to like put the belt on me. Um, like within, I, I think I signed a contract with them in June of like June 2nd or something, let's say of like 2004. And by August 11th, which is probably like six weeks away, I was X division champion. So, um, I like Jeff because Jeff always booked me well. You know, I, I think he was like, you know, I, Jeff liked me. We, we were, we're not like close friends or anything like that. Like we don't text each other late at night or anything or, I, I think in my lifetime, I've talked to him maybe like twice on the phone and maybe like uh, two text message conversations. Um, so I have like, I mean, Jeff and I always have got along. Um, he, he's never treated me bad or anything like that. So why would I not want to see him come back? Um, he's I, a lot of people don't know Jeff, like the, the, the real Jeff Jarrett, like they just see what he's on on TV and some people think like, oh, he's boring or whatever. I don't think so. But I mean, that's what a lot of people think. But man, like when you're just hanging out with Jeff, he is like the funniest guy. Like I'm just like rolling on the floor laughing every time that, you know, I I'm around him. He's just he's always like he's all about comedy and stuff like that, which he doesn't use on TV, which I always thought was was weird. But, uh, you know, so much so that I coined him Uncle Jeff. And that's what I call him. I call him Uncle Jeff. 
So I, I remember it like at one time um, when I wasn't working for TNA, I signed with this group called uh, Lucha Libre USA. And I was working down in Albuquerque for them for a while. And, uh, uh, you know, I even started agenting for them because they had no idea what they were doing. And I had to like help them like with their camera angles and all that stuff. And then Jeff called me up and he was like, and it's one of the two conversations on the phone I had with Jeff. And he's like, Hey, PD, what's going on? It's Jeff. And I'm like, Oh, Uncle Jeff, you know, and then I, that's when he was starting his like race car wrestling or whatever that I wasn't able to participate in because my contract, Lucha, Lucha Libre USA. Um, but yeah, I've never had a problem with him. Um, I, I, I wish I could give you gossip on why he's gone. Um, I don't know anything further. Like, I, I really just don't know what's going on, probably because I don't. I don't really seek to care to know what's going on. I know Jeff. I know who he is. Um, anything that, unless I see it myself, anything that I hear about him, I, I feel a speculation. Um, but would I like to see him come back? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, I think the listeners of the Hillcast also would like to see Jeff back. So we, we wish him well. Um, well, PD, I'm an avid listener of your podcast. Um, so I know the answer to this question, but for the listeners that don't know, uh, have you signed a short-term or long-term deal with Impact Wrestling? Um, let's say that is a on a show-to-show basis, we'll call that, I guess. Um, I could put it. Um, don't have a long-term deal with them. So I, I guess you could call it like a, a short-term one. Um, we Since we film so infrequently, like before when I was with TNA, I was under contract, obviously, because we were filming um, – Minimum every other week, sometimes every week, depending on the schedule. Uh, and now, you know, when, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but originally when I came back this time to TNA, I thought the schedule was going to be every six weeks. Uh, they were going to film six shows in a four-day period every every six weeks. Last time we were down there in a six-day period, we filmed 12 shows. And then I think this time, if I had to guess, um judging by the schedule of the tapings we're going to be there for f- monday tuesday wednesday thursday i don't know if we're going to be there friday so i mean we might be filming anywhere from six to eight shows so as far as it stands right now um with the deal that i have worked out with impact is i will be at the bound for glory pay-per-view and the next set of and through the next set of tv tapings however long that's there that's going to be in so i don't know if it's gonna be six weeks or ten weeks or whatever and then tn or tna i keep wanting to call it tna um impact will uh we'll discuss when we're down there what's going to happen in the future so it's pretty much on a show by show basis um that's the best way to put it i'm gonna say uh if, if that's the case you just says that impact uh whatever gft whatever it's called now sign this man Long term, please. That's all I'm saying. I'm not just saying because Petey's on the show. I'm, I'm being for real, man. I want to see uh, a lot more Petey Williams. I've been missing a guy in Impact, and there's a lot to do with this guy still. Hey, hey, how do you know this isn't like uh, a strategy set up by me to stay away from a long term deal? How, how do you know that? <laughs> I was I wasn't trying to blow your cover, bro. You know? <laughs> oh, I think I blew my own cover now. I'm not, right, try, I'm not trying to sit down, Petey. <laughs> Thanks, man. Because Petey, we're gonna make them continue to offer you more and more money <laughs> until you actually take it. So how do you know that this isn't a ploy on our part to make you the richest man in wrestling? Look at all these swerves, man. You guys should be writing this show, man. Wow. We're we're the the heel cast for a reason, all right? We don't we don't we don't we don't pull punches and anybody that's ever listened to our podcast knows it. Now, Petey, look. Hey, I guess to be fair, this guy's uh I've also like written how many freaking columns trying to write for impact, so you know. At least someone agrees me there. No. That's right. That's right. No look, Petey. Bottom line is, no interview with Petey Williams would ever be complete without a discussion about your amazing finisher, let's face it, the Canadian Destroyer. This is, for my money, the the greatest finisher that I've ever seen. All these years later, I'm not going to lie, I still watch it in slow motion virtually every single time I see it. When you showed up in the ring, all I could think about, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, Petey, wasn't it, oh, cool, Petey Williams is back, but it was, I get to see the Canadian Destroyer again. <laughs> so my question for you, Petey, is when did you dream this thing up, right? And, and how hard was it to make it safe for your opponent? 
Um, I think uh, it, it was discussed um, on a car ride. Uh, I don't remember the, the specifics. I think like Chris Sabin was in the car. Uh, Truth Martini. Uh, he used to like work for Ring of Honor. Um, maybe Brian Gorey, who also was a ref there. Uh, and maybe another guy. I don't remember. And we were talking about then I was supposed to do it to Sabin at that show we were traveling to. We were actually traveling to an IWA Mid-South show. But then when we were working out our match, it just never... I, I, I don't think like we can... like. I don't think we could picture it in our head how it would look. So I think we scrapped it. And then the next IWA Mid Show South, uh, IWA Mid South show that I went to, um, Saban wasn't there. And I, uh, I was working Matt Seidel, Evan Bourne. And I said, Hey, Matt, I got this move I want to try. It's always scary. Like, whenever, whenever somebody comes up to me, it's like, Hey, man, I got this new move I want to try. I'm like, Oh, geez, I'm going to be the guinea pig and I'm going to hurt myself. Right. That's what I, that's what a wrestler thinks. But I told Matt it, and I, like, no describing. I'm like, I'm going to hook you like this, and then I'm going to flip over you, and you flip backwards. And he's like, okay, sure, let's do it. And, I mean, that that was it. Like, there was no – now I know how to tell the person how to protect themselves and all this kind of stuff, which I'll get into in a sec. But Matt was like, yeah, let's do it. And, like, it wasn't even the finish. It was the last move I did in the match, but he kicked out of it because I didn't <laughs> – Not neither of us knew how it was going to how it was gonna turn out. But then I hit it, and the place went absolutely bananas – and then, uh, you know, he kicked out, and then I set him up top. Then we did his, like, or I went up top, and then we did his, like, uh, Spanish fly off the top, like that, that moonsault rock bottom thing, whatever it's called. Um, and then that was the finish. Um, and then that's how it was born, pretty much. And then how I make it safe for the uh, opponent and all that, like, um, before, when I was trying to get the move over, I was asking people to take it, and they had nothing visually. Like, now you can see it on TV. So now people are, like, Yep, I know what it looks like. I can I can picture that in my head. But before I'm trying to get guys to do it so I can get the move over, and uh, you know people just couldn't envision it. And but now I say like you know hold my legs, tuck your chin. It's really safe. Like I've never hurt anybody with it. Um, the the if they follow my instructions, they're they're going to be golden. And I remember telling Sanjay, and I was I was trying to talk Sanjay into doing it the first time, and he didn't want to do it for the longest time. Um, and then I finally talked him into it at CZW and then I, like, he was nervous. He was so nervous to take it. Like it was still a newer move. And then we did it and the place went nuts. And then afterwards, Sancho was like, man, that was the easiest move to take ever. He's like, man, I'd, I'd, I'd take that every night for the reaction it gets. I'd take that over a clothesline. And I'm like, ah, sweet. And I, most recently, I don't know if you guys saw this, but, uh, I think, uh, TNA tweeted out, uh, uh, a YouTube clip, or maybe it's on their YouTube channel of um, what happened on last Thursday's Impact. Uh, they had like you know like a video package of myself versus Trevor Lee coming up at Victory Road this Thursday for the X Division title. And at like the 50 second one minute mark, uh, it has a clip of me giving Caleb Conley the Kane Destroyer. And then the last 30 seconds of the clip is just like a skip of me continuously doing the Kane Destroyer, like the the clip skips pretty much. So I, I, I pretty much broke the internet with the Canadian destroyer. <laughs> that's awesome. I, that, <laughs> I, I, that's how it is. Speaking of Caleb Cowley, um, outside of impact wrestling, he, he's using the Canadian destroyer as a finisher. Uh, oh, would, yeah. you, would you have any uh, issues with him using it in impact? Yeah, absolutely. You don't do that. Um, and <laughs> I don't even have to say that um, because I, I, when I was standing backstage with him, he says, uh, what, what did he say? He goes, yeah, you know, we worked each other, like, before. And, man, I'm such horrible because I've, like, it's called big timing when you don't remember people. And, I, I mean, I'm a nice guy. I, I, don't, I just don't remember people when I, I meet them. Like, I've done it to Christian York on accident. I've even done it to MVP. Like, I didn't remember meeting him the first time I met him. And when I introduced myself the second time, he's like, yeah, I know, we've met. And I'm like, oh, man, I feel like a dick now. <laughs> um, so, you know, Caleb Conley, he's like, yeah, we worked each other. Like, I said, we have? And he's like, yeah, it was like six years ago and wherever, North Carolina, South Carolina. I, I don't remember what he said. Um, and I was like, really? And I said, do you remember what we did? Like, did we do the destroy? Like, I, I couldn't remember any of it. But he remembers the match. And, and that's cool. And he even said, he's like, man, I'm just pissed at your back because now I can't do the destroyer. And that's all he said to me. So, I mean, he knows he can't do it anymore. 
I mean, I, I don't know if he's ever done it on Impact, but he does it on the Indies all the time. And I mean, and that's part of it. Me coming back, um, and I mean, you see it on the internet. People are like, "Man, would all you indie guys stop doing the Destroyer? Like four of them in a match, and every single match there's a Canadian Destroyer." So I'm like, "Enough, enough. Not enough. That's enough." I'm like, "I'm gonna come back." So that way, if you do the Destroyer, it just looks like you're ripping me off. That plain and simple. <laughs> Let's never retire. That way, that people won't rip your stuff off. Yeah, next time I, I can retire, handle that. Yeah, uh, next time I retire, I'm not going to tell anybody I retire. You're just not going to see me on TV anymore, and I'm just not going to accept any independent bookings. And people will think I'm just still around. Uh, I just I don't want you to retire. I, everybody's got to retire sometime. I know, and I I, I got to tell you something though. I'm still think it's pretty cool that uh, Truth Martini had something to do with the Canadian Destroyer. Uh, I got I got to be honest with you, PD. I didn't see that one coming. And, and I can only imagine, right, that you guys could have a heck of a podcast just talking about uh, car rides with Truth Martini. That guy totally sounds like he would be a complete blast to, uh, to to ride in a car with. Yeah, Truth Martini is a blast, man. I like I like riding with him when he's not sleeping in the car because sometimes that's what he does. Um, yeah, but I've been on many road trips with Truth, not knowing, like, where we're going to spend the night and stuff like that. But he always finds us a place. It's, it's a blast, man. Like, Truth uh, – Truth's a hell of a guy and a hell of a character. No doubt, man. Uh, I mean, Petey, is this kind of like you return as a like an example of the king coming back to take what's his and make sure that Canadian destroyer doesn't get taken up, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, and I, I tried to explain this to uh, you know uh, the the TNA office. I was like, listen, you know, like look at look at TNA's glory day or glory days and, and who was in it at that time and where they're at now. All right. So the way I look at it, like those glory days of, of TNA, that, that was like our attitude era. I mean, nowhere close to the actual attitude era, but that was like TNA's attitude era or whatever you want to call it. Like that was our glory days. And all those guys are gone. I'm the only one, only one left on those glory days that was like positioned in the, like actually booked well, um, in the show, like I, like I, I, I beat AJ Styles on the very first monthly pay per view we ever had, Victory Road, um, thirteen years ago. You know, AJ was all over the poster, all over the promos, all over the video clips. You know, him, Jeff Jarrett, Monty Brown, all those, all those big names that they wanted to position that way, and I was nowhere to be found. And I'm like, well, you know, AJ's going to win his belt back for me, but no, they they wanted to do something different. They wanted to push me, and they had me beat their Golden Boy on their very first monthly pay-per-view so i mean not too many people they in impact now could say they've done that and i'm like and in that era i'm the last one left so i mean yeah i mean that that, that's what it is right there yeah um that being your attitude era man i'll admit i mean like uh as much as i love this company now i mean the the old glory days of tna i mean that's that's where it's at for me and i still miss that uh I guess question. I mean, what's your like favorite or your greatest match in TNA uh, throughout your entire tenure there? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that before. Um, I mean that that match with AJ. I, I don't like it was. It wasn't even like long enough to be like a, a, an epic match, but the feeling, like just just the feeling of that match, like just to walk you through that a little bit like that day, like it was so big because that was our first monthly pay-per-view and like macho man was on the show. I mean, it, it was huge. And like I was in a, a prime spot and you know, and I, I only got signed a couple months prior and now I'm against up against AJ styles, you know, the, the guy that they're like the, their poster boy pretty much for the company. And I, I remember we, we did the match and that the crowd was just like, phenomenal like it, 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 it was awesome like i couldn't i couldn't believe it. and i go to the back and like believe it or not like you know scott demore and i were actually broken down into tears because you know demore he was with me right when i started you know he trained me and stuff like that and then now we're, we were at the position of where we're at in wrestling and like he was just so proud of me and i was like uh, like so happy that he was able to give me this opportunity that we were actually broken down in tears and that's a shoot. Like that's what really happened. So, I mean that just that feeling, I don't feel like it was my best match, but that was like the best feeling I've ever gotten out of a match and afterwards and stuff like that. I guess that's that awesome. 
that answers your question. Yeah, no doubt, man. Definitely does. A, a awesome response there. Um, you know, uh, I guess, is, is would you say AJ's maybe the, uh, your favorite that you've enjoyed working with overall throughout your TNA uh, GFW career? Would, would there be like someone different that kind of, you know, you enjoyed I would say, working with I would say probably Chris Saban was probably my favorite. And like when I did retire three years ago, um, he was just coming off TNA. He just quit TNA. You know, he was like world champion and stuff like that. And this was like his first indie show back um, to Detroit. And I kind of felt bad for him because, you know, he he's he was on TNA forever. He hasn't, you know, been a free agent, and this is his first match back. But then um, when I contacted the promoter, I said, hey, this match is going to be my last match. He didn't have a match. Like, he, he didn't have my opponent booked yet. And, uh, like, he didn't know who it was going to be. And he said, do you have any suggestions? And I said, um, either Chris Saban, since I know he's going to be on the show, and he's, like, my favorite opponent to work with, or Gutter. You guys, I know, don't know Gutter. I, maybe you do, but anyways, Gutter was my very, very first match, like, 14 years prior. So I'd have been like, oh, that would have been, that would be cool to, like, wrestle my first and last match against the same guy. Um, and then he said, oh, I'll put you a Saban. And, like, I felt bad for Saban because it was his big return. But people didn't care that much because, oh, you know, Petey Williams, it's his last match. So it kind of overshadowed it. And that was not my point at all but i mean that's that's how it was booked so it was what it was and what was funny about that show too is sabe and i were last but the match right prior to us was zach gowan okay one leg cancer survivor uh against this other guy named ashley six who had some other form of cancer who was a cancer survivor so it was like the battle of the cancers and then after the match they both grabbed the mic talk about how they beat cancer and you know crying and all this kind of stuff and cancer cancer and i'm like saving we have to go and follow cancer now i mean how are we gonna do this you know so um that was a funny moment of that show you know it's funny you mentioned chris saving because uh as we were talking earlier um i i and i do actually think this was unbreakable and i think uh one of, honestly one of the best matches that kind of really blew my mind throughout the history of this company that i think is very overrated it was an it was an x division title match between you and chris saving and i think you know obviously with uh the pay-per-view that it was on and, you know, the, the big match at the end, I think it looked, it got really overshadowed, but I feel, uh, if people go back and watch that match, it, you, you really see a classic match there. And I just, I, I've always wanted to like give props to that one. And I think it's a very underrated match. Yeah, no, that was uh, probably one of my favorite, like actual wrestling type matches. Um, the, the reason why I brought it down a notch and it, it wasn't my absolute fate. Well, it probably still is, but, um, I remember that pay per view. I think it was like a December pay per view of 2004, and um, we were coming up with the the finish, and you know we're like, oh, yeah, PD, you know, cheat whatever, and then we're thinking Canadian Destroyer, you know, top it off with the the best move at the end. But you know, the office really didn't want the Canadian Destroyer as the finish. They wanted like something more heelish. So we have this great, awesome, phenomenal, like athletic back and forth match and everything. Everything went great in it. And then I pull out the brass knuckles and hit him with the brass knuckles. One, two, three. And it was just like, to me, it was like, wah, wah. even though that's such a heel thing to do. Um, you know, I would have liked to hit him with the brass knuckles, then hit him with the destroyer at least. But I mean, they didn't want that either for whatever reason. Um, but it was what it was. But I really, really enjoyed that match. I remember uh, DDP was working with the company at one time, or at, at that point, and uh, he was watching the match backstage, and he was telling me about it, and he was like, yeah, when he hit that uh, off the ropes, and he did the reverse like power bomb or whatever, then floated over you, then gave you the pile driver, I walked away and said, wow, that was a hell of a match, and then you kicked out of it, bro, and like he, he was going on, he's like, man, I couldn't believe it and stuff like that, and then he's like, but you know what I think you need? I'm like, what's that, DDP? He's like yoga you should do my yoga bro and i should have jumped on it back then before it was like all like cool to do ddp yoga um but i was like yeah sure i'll do your yoga and never thought anything about it and now i'm regretting it because i could have been doing ddp yoga for 13 years (laughs) now you got that ddp yoga plug but uh you know i'm just saying i I remember him pitching it to me before it was anything you know and sometimes you wish you would have hopped on a bandwagon before it was cool uh, yeah, I, I missed the opportunity. It's wild, man. What you don't know. Um, you know what? I, this impromptu question off here, the record, but uh, a couple of weeks back on the show, this actually got uh, suggested. And so I got, I feel like I got to ask you here. So, Petey, look, you're back. 
Scott Diamore is back. I mean, uh, what about, you know, we got a new LAX. I mean, what about a uh, potential for a new Team Canada at some point? I want it. I'll tell you that. And if, if, if it was up to me, uh, I would definitely book that. Um, and I, I've pitched to Scott. Yeah. I said, well, let's get team. Let's get them. Obviously we can't get Bobby Roode and Eric Young. Um, but a giant of mine's floating around, you know, why, why not him? Uh, a one, I know is floating around. We just need another guy or we could have a whole new team. Um, it doesn't matter, but yeah, I mean, trust me. I, I want that. I, I like, being in a group like that, it just you, you could do so much more. You could be more involved in a show than just one angle and stuff. I remember when I was in Team Canada, I might be wrestling for the X Division title at one part of the show and then running out at the end with the rest of the, the Team Canada guys and beating up whoever, uh, Three Live Crew or whoever it was at the time. Um, so I, I really enjoy. Um, Team Canada, I'd love to see it back. I mean, I'm on your side with that one. Yeah, definitely. Definitely with Bound for Glory being in Canada, that would be, would be amazing if it happened in Canada. Um, speaking of your career, overall, what would you say your favorite moment or achievement in your teenage GFW Impact career is? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, one of my most memorable ones um, besides, you know, the victory road, uh, 13 years ago against AJ, that just, that, that was, that was something else. Um, back, uh, when I used to like doing ultimate X matches, uh, the one I had January, 2005 with Sabin and, uh, styles. I mean, that was, and, and the memorable moments in this is when like, you, you obviously know everything's timed and television and pay-per-view. So when they're like, hey, you have 18 minutes for a match, you got 18 minutes for a match, and the ref's telling you the times and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm always asking for the time. You know, I, I want to make sure I'm on time, we're at the right pace and all that kind of stuff. And then I just, I remember being in that Ultimate X match, and then the ref says the time, right? I, I thought he said like three minutes. And I said, what, how long? And he goes, don't worry. And I'm like, no, I need to know the time. He's like, no, they said, don't worry about the time. And I'm like, holy cow don't worry about the time meaning that they, the the office was enjoying this match so much that they are willing to cut time out of the following match i'm like wow. that that i well that's what it that's what it had to mean i mean or you're not going to go past the 11 o'clock hour or else you're going to be paying a lot of money like that'll that'll never happen um so uh, we just took our time and, and finished the match. I mean, we were pretty much going home anyways, but they said, don't worry about the time. So that was pretty memorable. And then um, in 2008, uh, it was the first pay-per-view we ever had in Canada. And man, I, I mean, I, I got goosebumps when it was myself versus uh, Sean Devari. I don't know what they called him um, in, in TNA. I can't remember. She, uh, uh, I don't know, Sean Devari and uh, Xavier Woods, and we had a three-way match, and we're we're in Canada. I don't remember what arena, but we're in the Toronto area. And when I came out, just the the crowd, like my music hit, and I came out like it was insane. I never had a reaction like that before because I was a heel on television the entire time. You know, I had the blonde hair, the the chainmail, doing the Steiner gimmick. But then when I came out in front of my home crowd, the place went absolutely bananas. And I was like, holy cow. It, like, it was just uh, amazing. That was one of my favorite moments in, uh, in my career, I would say, right there. You, just, you mentioned uh, Ultimate X. Um, why isn't Ultimate X your favorite matches anymore? Oh, because, I mean, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> I'm, that's the plain and simple. I mean, I've, done, I've only done a handful but I mean, there's been so many Ultimate X matches that I mean, I'm just I, I don't even know what else to do besides just I don't know taking like a double backflip off there. I mean, without killing yourself, I I, I, I just don't know what else to do. Um, you know, and I, I try to put psychology in those matches so it's not just everybody just falling down from the from the cables. Um, they're just, they're tough to plan. There's no pinfalls. The drama can only be built so much. And, um, and, and, and they hurt. I mean, it's, it's a toll on your body. I mean, you're falling kind of far, uh, down to the mat and they're just a tough match to plan. And I like that they don't have them 
like before, it seems like they were having him like every other month. So I'm so glad they dialed back on him and they don't have him as much anymore. But um, yeah, my first couple I enjoyed. But then after that, I was like, especially they made us do an Ultimate X match back to back, like two nights in a row one time. And I was I was pretty pissed about that because the they rigged up the you had to grab an X, like a, a wooden X, and it kept falling. I don't know if you guys remember this. But it was myself, uh, Michael Shane, and Chris Saban. And the X, like, we'd fall off the, the cables, and then the X would bounce, and then it would fall in the middle of the ring. And it kept doing that, and the stagehands had to come up and climb up the ladder and put it back up, and the crowd was booing and stuff like that. And then the end of the match, I think one of the guys fell off, and then the X was jiggling again. And me, jokingly, I was just underneath, like, oh, come on, you know, fall to me. And I had my arms out, and it just fell into my hands. <laughs> and I'm like, this is ridiculous. And I'm looking at Dixie Carter, who's in the front row, and she's kind of shrugging her shoulders. Like, and Demore runs in the ring. And he's like, "Celebrate! You won!" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I won! You know, I'm <laughs> celebrating." Um, and then they made us do it again the next night uh, for Spike TV, and you know, and they apologized to the fans because the X kept falling and stuff like that. But then we had to all our ideas that we had, we already blew in the match the night prior so now over a 24-hour period not even we have to come up with a brand new ultimate x type match and it's like oh my god we got to do it again so you know it, it kind of sucks now now Petey, you know you've been doing this a long time you know you're one of the senior members of the roster and you know you talk about things like you know ring psychology and putting together matches you know of the faces that are currently with you know, Impact, GFW, whatever they're currently calling themselves, who do you think does the best job at that? The, the best, not even just wrestlers and faces, but tacticians of the company, uh, folks that really stand out among the current uh, talent that you think is going to take this company over the next five to ten years, you know? Not just in the heavyweight division, but the X division as well. Um. So I'd say Matt Seidel. Um, he's been around for a long time and awesome. He could do, he's so smooth with everything he does and his high flying stuff. And he has a psychology to back it up to make all his moves mean something. He could sell. Um, so yeah, Matt Seidel is definitely up there. And, you know, and he has a lot of experience. He's been all over the world, works, worked for every company. So he, he should be good, you know? So. He um, should. Now, I, I got a favor to ask of you, all right? What's up? I need you to get Matt Seidel to bring his Ring of Honor entrance to Impact. Okay, I don't even know what that was. but That was uh, when he came and he literally jumped and slid into the ring. Yeah, okay. I'll ask nope. him. Maybe We need maybe to see that. It. I marked out for that every time. That's another thing. You can tell Matt I said that, that I would watch over and over again, which is Matt entering the ring. And he doesn't do it in impact. And it's like, come on, man, as, as great as you are, that is like, that's like your signature for me. I love that. All right. I'll tell him to bring back his old entrance. I'll do that. I, I can't promise you he's going to want to do it, but um, I'll ask him. Yeah. Awesome. Now, besides Matt, because Matt is, Matt is a phenomenal talent as well. Who else do you think is, is somebody that's going to be able to stand there over the next five to 10 years? Uh, Trevor Lee. Tre uh, Trevor Lee's really good. I, I finally, well, you guys were going to see on Thursday, that was my first time working him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we did a tag match, obviously, a couple weeks ago on Impact. And uh, um, he's just, he, he's so good. Um, plays a, I, I feel a great heel. Um, his psychology's there. Even when I was saying, yeah, let's do this, that, and the other thing. And he's like, he was even like, yeah, but. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, good point. You know, like, that, that does make sense. And, uh, yeah, I, I think... I think he's got it. He's young too. So, um, I think he's like a dozen years younger than me or something like that. Uh, and then also, uh, uh, Desmond Xavier, I could see him being, cause I mean, he, he's so smooth with all his stuff too. And he's young and, uh, you know, he's got a good look and stuff like that. I think, um, I, I, I haven't got to work him yet. So, I don't know. I, I've never put a match. I, I would know more about him. I got to put a match together with him. Um, but all his all his stuff looks great and his selling and all that kind of stuff. So I could see him. The, the X Division is looking bright, I would say, for the future. Yeah. 
So uh, you were just talking about talent that you like working with. Uh, how'd you like working with Scott Steiner? And did you like the Maple Leaf uh, muscle gimmick? Yeah, I, I liked working with him. Um, Scott's a hell of a guy. I, I thought at first he was going to be like, um, I, I don't know, like not like when we put together a match, like I thought he wasn't going to let me give anything to him. You know what I mean? Like any moves or anything or like want himself to look weak in the ring. But he was all about bumping for me. Like I remember the, the first time we ever worked each other was like in South Carolina on a pay-per-view. And I always come up with this stuff where I'm like, you know, I'll hit the ropes, hit him with one clothesline, he doesn't bump, and then hit him with another clothesline, he doesn't bump, then like, you know, maybe I'll duck his clothes on him with a drop kick or whatever, and then he finally bumps, you know, like kind of like big man, little guy. But he didn't want to do any of that. He's like, no, man, you know, run at me, hit me with a flying forearm, and I'll bump, and then I'll feed up, and I'll, and I'm like, really? So, I mean, that was cool that he wanted to, 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 to bump around for a little guy. Um, so I, I really liked working with him, and I, I just liked, hanging out with him too because like it's not a dull moment with scotty i mean he could turn a conversation into like a a a talking point when i bring it back and tell the other boys what i was just talking about with scotty um and the maple leaf muscle gimmick um i i I liked it i actually came up with the the before i got with steiner um alex shelley actually came up with the maple leaf muscle gimmick because vince russo um Wow, I'm I'm thinking of too many things that happen right now. But when Vince Russo got the book, um, I don't think he really knew who I was, per se. And we were in uh, Plymouth, Michigan, which is like right outside Detroit for a for a pay per view. And I just moved to Orlando, and I said, "Hey, Vince, you know, I want to run some ideas by you. I don't even think I had any ideas, but I just wanted to talk to him, you know." Um, and he's like, yeah, 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 you know, just stop by the impact zone. I'm like, ah, oh, he just totally blew me off, right? So he kept blowing me off. So I'm like, all right, I'll go out and do my match. And it was a gauntlet match. And then um, I came out, and the place went nuts. And I'm like, oh, sweet. And I hit the Canadian Destroyer, and the pay- place came unglued. And this was, like, our first pay-per-view um, outside of the impact zone. So it's the first time, like, he got to see me in another setting that wasn't the impact zone where everybody got to see me every single week. And then, so I do my match. I get to the backstage, I'm watching the rest of the show, and then Russo comes up to me and he says, Petey, man, how's it going? Hey, we need to talk. I have some great ideas I want to run by you. And I'm like, oh, oh, you do, do you? I'm like, all right, cool, right? So um, then he pushed me for a little bit doing this, like, Captain America gimmick, which I wasn't feeling or whatever. And then, you know, that happened for a few months. And then Russo, after I was off TV for about six months, he was like, hey, man, you need to come up with a gimmick all right. It was almost like you need to come up with a gimmick or else. That's what it felt like. So I was really struggling for one. And then I went to Alex Shelley and, you know, I went to Russo and I was like, yeah, what about this? And he's like, no, those are all angles. I don't want angles. I want you to have a gimmick. And I'm like, ah, all right. So I went up to Alex Shelley and he was like, yeah, you know, there's these guys in Japan. I think it was like Dragon Gate or something. He's like, they do this muscle gimmick where like one guy, he's like speed muscle and another guy is like this muscle and so on and so forth. And they, their heels and they'll use like the rubber bands that you work out with to like choke guys with. And instead of like powder in the eyes, they'll throw like protein powder in the eyes. I'm like, Oh dude, this is golden. So I pitched this idea to Russo and Russo's like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds, that sounds not bad. Okay. We can try that. Right. And, uh, uh Russo liked it. And he's like, I, I got a good name for the character. And I'm like, what? And he's like, we'll call you Mr. Maple Leaf. And you do oh, bodybuilding shows. I know, right? And I'm like, that's exactly what I was thinking in my head, right? Oh, it's, man. There goes my career. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And I was like, uh, all right. Well, yeah, let, let me let me, let me, me uh, think about that. And then I went back to Alex Shelley, and I'm like, listen what Russo wants to do. And then he's like, oh, brutal. And I'm like, any ideas? And Alex Shelley's really good at coming up with ideas like that. He's like, yeah, you should call yourself Maple Leaf Muscle like the speed muscle guy and all that kind of stuff. Like it just makes sense. Right. Um, and I'm like, yeah. So I go to Russo and I tell him and he's like, yeah, okay. I like it. And I'm like, sweet man. I don't have to be Mr. Maple Leaf. So yeah. And then that's how it went. I love so doing it. The norm with Russo. Cause let's face it. You either love Russo or you hate him. Okay. He's, he's one of the most polarizing people, like for, for sure in all of professional wrestling next to maybe that guy up North. Was that what it was like with him? Because I always imagined that he came up with these crazy ideas, you know, himself versus him just saying, 
yeah, PD, you need to get a gimmick. Make one up. Yeah, no, no, he's good at listening to you. Like, um, he'll he'll hear you out. He definitely will. Because I mean, he's got a lot of stuff to write. He doesn't have all the ideas. He might be able to be like, um, like like for example, not all all his ideas work. Like, what was good about him is that I caught his eye. You know, first he wanted to have nothing to do with me at the beginning of the day, and by the end of the day, he wanted to have, oh, dude, you just have to embrace America, get rid of this Canada thing, and embrace America. And I knew that wasn't going to work because I don't feel comfortable doing that. I mean, I'm, I'm an American citizen now, but I mean, I didn't grow up like with a white picket fence waving the American flag and, you know, standing on a national anthem and all that stuff. Like I was born in Canada. It was a totally different country. So, I mean, it's their national anthem, right? That's your national anthem. What's my national anthem? Well, I'm saying at this point, at this point, it's both. Oh, yeah, but yeah, I'm saying yeah, at the yeah. time, I mean, it was the Canadian national anthem is yeah. what you identified with. So why wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. everybody loves the Canadians, but you could be a bad guy too. Yeah. The drop of a hat. Why? Why would you want to lose that? I, I I don't know. But he he's like, we need to turn you babyface, and I'm like, all right. And then I think my first feud was with like LAX because they were trying to like destroy the American flag, and I saved it. And then um, that didn't last for long. And then I feuded with James Storms for a while, and then Bobby Roode, and then. I was kind of, I was kind of done. And, um, I, I just knew it wasn't going to, I mean, people were like, I, I think people, we, we can only insult the intelligence of the fans for so long or, or so much, I should say to a certain extent, they're like, okay, this guy's from Canada. You know, he's always like spewed his Canadian beliefs at us or whatever. And now he's embracing America. Just, you know, like it doesn't even sound natural from him. Like it, and it wasn't, I mean, I, and, and, and pro pro, USA has been done so many times before, and it's been done better. So what makes it think that I'm going to be able to get it over? You know, I have a move. The move's called the Canadian Destroyer, but I'm going to say USA. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, not all his, all his ideas are, are are good and stuff, um, but that's, that's every writer, man. Like, it, there's some good ideas, some bad ideas. Now you know you mentioned the, uh, the the Canadian contingent, right? And is there really uh, a Canadian contingent? You know, like I work in, a, in an office with a lot of internationals, and you know you see them kind of huddle together in a corner. D- do you see that in wrestling? Do the Canadians travel together a lot? I mean, you're coming from the same areas. We know that you know Rosemary and Steve have been working together for lots of years, and Allie as well, and, and some of the other ones. Uh, is is that is that really like a contingent? Do you guys travel together a lot? Um, well, when I, I used to travel, it was always with the X division guys, just because I'm always working them. You, you tend to, whoever you like work with the most or like your peer group, kind of, you used to travel with them. Like I was always traveling with the machine guns, Xavier Woods, Jay Lethal, Sanjay, you know, Jimmy Rave, th- those guys. Cause I mean, that, we're always wrestling each other, you know? And, um, you know, I would travel with, uh, at first, like when I first started there, I was traveling with Eric Young and Bobby Roode, like they were you know, my team Canada pretty much. So, um, and we were in a tight circle, but then, you know, you just kind of branch out and go with, you know, the, the, the people you feel comfortable with, I guess. Um, I think there's a, a mutual respect there when you're Canadian, because I think every Canadian knows the hardship of trying to get work in the U S and kind of like for, well, I, I guess working over in the U S illegally. Cause that's what, every Canadian wrestler does. Cause we don't have a visa. Well, I got in to start out with a visa. You have to get sponsored to get a visa to work in the U S. So, you know, I was traveling across the border illegally to, you know, when I first started work for whatever, 20 bucks, 50 bucks or a Twinkie or whatever. Um, just, just to get noticed and stuff like that. Um, so I think there's that mutual respect there, knowing the hardships that the Canadians have to go through to get, to make a name for themselves. That's awesome. Uh, you know, PD, here's the thing. Um, uh, before we jump to this next question, man, I mean, I, you mentioned Scott Steiner. You said he was he was great to work with. But look, I mean, Big Papa Pump's got this reputation for being like a nut and being just crazy and out there. You know, I mean, we've seen the math references and all. I mean, it's kind of like uh, you put this guy on TV. He's just going <laughs> to you put this guy on TV. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, is is there some truth to like the, the like the, the the nutness out there? Like him just being like kind of a loose cannon. I mean, is that it's kind of all like an act? You know what I mean? Um, I think he's toned down, um, you know, now that he has kids and stuff like that, I think that's what's really kind of mellowed him out a bit, but I mean, he's still, he's still 
crazy, I would say. Um, and he still has a reputation. I mean, uh, there's people in the locker room that don't want to go near him. I remember I was doing a show up in, uh, oh, like London, Ontario in Canada. And, uh, you know, he always finds his own dressing room. I don't know how he does it. Um, everybody will be dressing in one area and he'll find like a random room in the building that I didn't even know would exist, but he'd find it to, to, to dress there kind of privately. And, uh, uh, I, I was, I had to work him on the show and, you know, I was, so I'm in his, the dressing room that he found that he's by himself, but to get to the bathroom for the boys in the locker room, to get to the bathroom, they had to cut through this dressing room and uh big Vito was on the show and he opens up the door and you could see he's like not wanting to make eye contact with Steiner and he's kind of making a beeline towards the bathroom and Steiner's just like, Hey Vito. And then he's like, hey, y- y- yes, Scotty. Yes. And he was like, Hey, how's it going, man? He's like, uh, good, Scotty. How, how, how are you? He's like, good. He's like, all right, bye then. And like, he was like super afraid of him. And I've never seen Vito like that before. So, I mean, I don't know if Scotty like bull- bullied Vito before or, or whatever. So, yeah, he definitely does have that reputation. But, I mean, I've never seen it in the TNA days um, at, at all. PD, I'm not going to lie. If I walked up and I saw Scott Steiner in a dark alley, I'd pick up my kids and run like hell. And most people would. And, and I, I think most people would, but I think that's, I think that's why maybe he liked me and I earned his respect because like the first couple times I met him, I think he tried to like, you know, pull that like bully type angle with me. And I totally stood up with them and I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. Right. And like, I, I kind of called him on it. And I think back in the WCW days, I think he would just beat the crap out of those people or do something to like bully them. But he kind of like backed down and was like, "Huh, like this kid's sticking up for himself." All right, okay, I guess I like him. I mean, that's the only thing I could logically think of of why, of why he liked me. Maybe he was trying to do the math in his head as to whether or not he could beat you. Yeah, probably. And it was just taking a while. <laughs> it was. I, I don't like. Maybe he had to like factor in my height and weight, and he can't do like you know all that at once. And I, I don't know. Knows. I think there's 166 and four tenths chance that uh, that he was going to win the match, right? Best promo ever, and that was one take, guys. That's one awesome. take. Wow. <laughs> you could tell by my expression on my face. I looked at the camera and I'm like, "Are we cutting? Are we still? No, we're still rolling. All right, I'll stay in character then." <laughs> How hard was that to stay in character during that? I mean, well, you with, saw. With I, I totally. Break? Yeah, I totally looked at the camera. It's a good thing I had like glasses on and stuff. And I was like, really? Uh, oh, you, you guys like this? Okay. All right. Well, we're not cutting. So I'm just going to get back into this promo. And and it's like some of the stuff he – I mean, I'm, I'm good at not breaking character during a promo because I just want to get it done with. Um, but, uh, I mean, there, there's been times where we we're doing like 20 takes because he's stumbling over words. And Vince Russo is laughing. And then Scotty will get pissed. He's like, why are you laughing at me? And all this kind of stuff. And then they would, like, uh, it was just a mess. He was stumbling over words. I mean, that's who he is, though. Yeah, and that's what that's what Russo would try to say. He was like, no, no. Like, Scotty would be like, no, I messed up. Let's do it again. He's like, no, Scotty. He's like, bro, <laughs> it's so good. Like, it's okay if you stumble over words because it's like, it's your character. You have all this pent up frustration in you that you just, you can't even talk straight. And you just, you're so aggressive. I'm like, that's good. And, you know, Scotty was like, whatever, let's do it again. You know, like, so I, I see Russo knew what good TV was and that was good TV when, when Scotty would stumble over words and stuff. Um, maybe not to, to, to Steiner. It was good because he was stumbling over words, but Vince knew that that was good TV. I think, I think that's what everyone loved about him though, too. It was that he always, yelled, you know, he always yelled at everything he was going on. He never was calm. He just always was so aggressive. Like we were saying, yeah, and like some of them, you had to put subtitles on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel Scott Steiner's pain with the stumbling over the words. Like uh, the RIB has the exact same issues. It's just everyone doesn't love me for it. And I'm not intimidating like him, but uh, you know the the whole. I mean, like the WCW days, and you brought up uh, that. I mean, man, that that story about him and DDP in that fight. I mean, that's just bananas. Uh, just to hear that shit, you know. Yeah, and I, I think the reason why he calmed down, too, is like in WCW, I mean, there was probably a lot more money on the line to make sure your character, you know, was over. I mean, just a lot more money to be made in WCW and WWE days, you know, back in the Attitude Era. And so TNA, it's kind of, you know, it's a step down, not as much money to be made. 
uh, you know, I think he knew his place and uh, the most he'd be able to make and all that stuff. So it was probably not worth fighting for. And it's funny. Like, I got like big veto being, uh, you know, kind of intimidated by him. But then, you know, JB's got the, I, JB just got the balls, I guess, just walk up and, you know, cool with Scott Steiner like that. It's kind of funny to hear that stuff. Cause I mean, when you hear about JB and him interacting, it's pretty funny to hear when comparison yeah. to that. And, and you know what? And I pitched big time Two two things I pitched when I went back to TNA. I said, team Canada, and I need Scott Steiner on my side. So I said, one of those two, make it happen. That'll make me happy. That would make I, me happy. I would want well. him on my side, too. I would definitely I just, want him on my side. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I, that, I, I'll wrestle him. It don't matter. I just want to be on TV in an angle with him because it's just awesome. I mean, so many stories. I mean, it, awesome. Just love it. Would that make you sign that full-time contract with Impact Wrestling if either of those came through? Oh, yeah, for sure. You hear that now, guys. <laughs> if we, could get, if we yeah. could get Scott Steiner and Petey Williams signed to a, a long-term contract with GFW Impact, whatever it's called, that would be amazing. Yeah. Just the best. And yeah, I'm, <laughs> I mean, he's got kids now and all. I mean, the guy beat Wilt Chambers' rec- Wilt Chambers rec- record. I mean, you know, pretty sure he's got to have kids somehow or another. At least some, some he might not know about if that's the case. But. Yeah, yeah. I think well, he's in the, the restaurant business with. now, too. You know, Peter, you, you made mention of, of WCW and money to be made and, and, and TNA, GFW, Impact Wrestling. Probably the number one topic of conversation on ImpactAsylum.net on any given day is what does the company need to do to increase their rating, to increase the ability to make that money? It's a topic that we cover, you know, ad nauseum. What, in your mind, you know, what's the number one thing the company needs to do to, to get back where it was and to actually even move the bar higher? Um, well, that's like a double-edged sword right there because they need to do two things that are the exact opposite. Um, and I, I don't know how they're going to do it. Uh, so first, you know, to, to get it up there, I mean, you need uh, like some, some like top talent and stuff like that. Um you know, and top talent is going to cost money. And it's something that, you know, if you, the more money you pay, the more they're going to go in the red. And then, you know, the closer they are to going out of business, you know, because a company's goal is to make money. Right. Um, but then they also need to cut their budget somehow, you know, like I, I've, I, they're doing a good job at it by kind of, uh, condensing all these TV tapings, like when when we were down there, I was only there for four days, but I wrestled one, two, three, four, five, six times, and I did a run in. So I mean, they're they're trying to condense it and like give you a like a a day rate rather than like this how many shows you're on and stuff like that. So they're trying to cut budget like that, um, and save on like production and all that kind of stuff. But then when you do that, and you're just running at a bare minimum. You're you're not like building stars at the same time because nobody's having an extravagant entrance or anything. Like that. Anything that makes you look like a superstar. Um, and then you know if you don't pay talent, they're not going to want to work there, right? So say if you have somebody like uh, I'll give you a prime example. I don't know if you guys know who Jeff Cobb is, um, but Jeff Cobb, I, I don't know, eh, is he signed with a? Uh, he might be signed with a Japanese company, but he's not signed with like Ring of Honor or WWE or TNA. Um, and he's a great talent. He's like a he's like a Samoa Joe, but he can do like moonsaults and all that kind of stuff. But he's um, like so strong and all that kind of stuff. Great worker and everything. But like, if there was a bidding war, T- there's no way TNA would get him because they'd be like, you know what? He doesn't. He we we like we love him. We'd want him, but he doesn't fit into our budget. Whereas WWE, they have the biggest budget in the world, so they could just snatch him up. So all the new up and coming talent. WWE's just snatching up, throwing them in the NXT and all that kind of stuff. So um, finding new fresh talent is not going to happen with TNA unless they get somebody that nobody's heard of on the indies and then they end up blowing up and being a star. So it's it's really tough. How they do it, I really don't know. Because if I knew, then I could tell them and they'd be doing it. So yeah, Is that sustainable, re- what WWE is trying to do? I mean, let's yeah. face it, their ratings aren't that great either. They're but dropping. They, yeah, but I mean, just their uh, their their copyright, their marketing and stuff. Just putting that WWE WWE logo on things, like 
you know, the shirts you see at Walmart and all that kind of stuff, they make huge money off that because you're putting the WWE brand on something and then people have to pay for that, that trademark and copyright and stuff like that. So they're making so much more than just like, you know, the advertisements from TV and stuff like that. Like they're, they're a household name. They have it on everything. You go on your, your phone and they have like, I don't know, three or four video game apps on there. They got their so much stuff. They have like WWE perfumes, uh, you name it, they got it. Right. So just them branding themselves, they have the budget for that, but then that's, what's keeping them above water. So, I mean, and then you got, you know, the network, they got a million subscribers. That's $10 million a month, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, the, the ratings aren't going well, but I mean, look at a- any TV show, like even, you know, you have something like the walking dead and stuff like that. Yeah. The ratings are high, but it's not like high, like, you know, some of the shows back in the day when there was only like 50 channels rather than a thousand channels. I mean, the share is so much higher now. So, you know, the ratings are okay for the amount of channels that are out there nowadays and all the stuff that's going on and the competition with the internet and all this cord cutting stuff and everything. So they're, they're fine. That, that is totally sustainable what they're doing. And, you know, they're probably a traded company too. So, um, they have other people investing. Well, you, you, you were around uh, for a few appearances uh, towards the end of the, the Hogan Bischoff era. How would you uh, feel that regime is different than you know the regime now? Uh, and what reason? Uh, what reason uh, would uh, would didn't we see you remain at Impact when you left then? Um, it, it's different. I would say the regime now is similar to when I was there, starting in like two thousand four, um, because. It, if you look at 2004 and you look at now, um, n- not a lot of huge mega stars on our show right now. But in 2004, there wasn't either. You know, you had, you had a few guys. As time went on, like 2005, 2006, we started getting the Dudley Boys and then Christian and Rhino and eventually Kurt Angle. Yeah, you know? and so we were getting a lot of these like I, I call them mega stars because they were, you know, world champions in WWE. Um, and then you fast forward to now, and we don't have. A, I mean, maybe with the exception of like Alberto and, uh, you know, maybe Johnny, Bobby Johnny Lashley. Impact. <laughs> yeah, jo- Johnny Impact. You know, there's a few, but I mean, not not like it was, uh, you know, in the Hogan days. <clears throat> Excuse me, the Hogan days and stuff like that. So I would say 2004, when I was there, is very similar to how it is now, which could be a good thing because if you look at we we went up. In 2004, like things were looking good, and you know we got we went from a weekly pay per view to Fox Sportsnet to Spike TV. I know we're on pop right now, but I, I don't know how long we'll be on pop. I know another year, but that doesn't mean like another network, you know, might not happen in the future and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely rebuilding. Um, I was there for a little bit for the Hogan era. That was weird. Um, it, it just probably because I didn't know anybody. Um, like in the office, like it's a lot of the same bookers that are there now that were there in 2004. Um, when I went in the Hogan, it was like, you know, Bischoff running the show. And, um, and I, I didn't even know who was in the office. I didn't even really know who to talk to. I was just kind of there having a good time. And I'm like, man, does Hulk Hogan even know who I am? Like it's, and which is funny because the, the first show I went to, you know, I was going to go up and introduce myself to Hogan, but by the time I got there, you know, he's like running in the ho- not running, but like walking very fast in the hallways, going from one interview thing to another. He's so busy. You know, I caught his eye like maybe once or twice in passing, but like I was in a room, he was in the hallway walking past really quick. And then I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'll catch him later when everything, you know, settles down. And then uh, I'm watching, I'm like half dressed. I'm in the back. I'm watching the monitor. I'm watching, uh, I think he had like some sort of in ring segment with uh, Sting. And then he comes to the back and kind of catches my eye again, walks past me. And uh, it looked like he was talking to Bischoff. And then he stopped, turned around and came back and he goes, brother, I'm sorry I didn't say hi to you today, man. I've been walking around with my head up my ass all day, man. How you been, man? You you good? You all right? And I'm thinking in my head, like, "Uh, apology accepted, Hulk Hogan. (laughs) Like, uh, uh, yeah, I'm great, man. You know, awesome. You know, and we just kind of shoot the breeze for a little bit. Then he walks away and he's like, all right, man, good seeing you. And takes off with Bischoff. And then I go to Bobby Roode and I'm like, this is Bobby. I'm like, does Hogan think I'm somebody else? He goes, no, man, he knows who you are. He's like, I'm like, he's, he's hip to our product and all and what's going on and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, 
I mean, I, that, that's pretty cool. I mean, I was like a Hulkamaniac when I was a little kid. So just to have that, like, to, you know, work on the same show as him, I mean, that's, that's When the goat huge. comes up to you and says, hey, man, how you doing? You know you're doing something <laughs> right. You know what I'm and saying? I, to apologize to me for not saying hi earlier, I'm like, what? What just happened here? Like, this is the Twilight Zone or something. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of people that you know that that say that you know Hawk was a cancer and he was a, a, a turn off and and a problem and then there's a lot of people that say that you know he did his best. What, what's your take on on Hawk and uh, TNA at the time? I mean, I don't know him. Like, I mean, that was the extent of my, uh, and I think I talked to him one other time after that. Um, that was the extent of it. Um. Uh, you know, and I did meet him in 2004, that first Victory Road pay-per-view we had um, with Macho Man on there. Ho- Hogan actually stopped by um, to hang out backstage, you know, so I-, I talked to him there for a second. But, I mean, that was like <clears throat> 2004. I went back in, I don't know, let's say 2013. So that was like nine, ten years later. I'm like, does he even remember? Like, I, I don't know. But, I mean, Hogan, I mean, biggest name by far in the industry, like made wrestling mainstream pretty much, uh, you know, in the early eighties. So, but you know, Hogan's a businessman. He's going to go where the money is, you know, TNA had the money and probably pitched him the idea of Hulk Hogan. And they, they probably bought it saying like, yeah, he's the biggest, you know, name in the industry. Um, and then, you know, the money dried up. So he left. I mean, that's, that's smart. I mean, I, I, I look at Hogan as he's a smart businessman and that's what he probably did. It was probably a business for him. And, you know, uh, the, the GFW duty, you mentioned Hogan being the GOAT, and I, did, I didn't know that Bret Hart was in uh, TNA either. But, I mean, look, other, I mean, what was That's what because was he wasn't. Man like? Exactly. Yeah. I'm just saying the GOAT, you know. But, I mean, what was Macho Man like? Did you, did you get to interact with him too much, Petey? Macho, yeah, just a little bit, just as much as I kind of did with Hogan. He, Macho Man is Macho Man 24-7, man. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, we're walking, like, and he just goes right up to Bobby Roode as we're, as we're passing. And he just grabs Bobby Roode's like bicep and arm and goes, Yo, what's causing all this, brother? And like, his wide eyes and stuff like that and just walks away. And I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, he's really macho, man, you know? And he's just uh, – th- that that's how he is, you know? Um, I don't know what else to say about that. I mean – look, you mentioned Bobby Roode. You know, we know the Team Canada thing. I mean, uh, you know, back in those days, did you, did you see – because I think, you know, like in 2009, right before you, you had left, I mean, Rude was really starting to kind of come across. We Like when they did the Mr. Wall Street stuff for a little bit there, I think that was 2008 or something. I, I think he showed potential. I mean, could you see that Rude was, you know, world champ material and, you know, kind of become this big thing that now he's finally getting elsewhere? Yeah, you, you knew that going in, I think, when uh, <clears throat> uh, he worked for, like, you know, some dark matches for WWE before 2004, before he went to TNA. And... uh when we first did that Team Canada thing with myself, Eric, Bobby, and Johnny, um, we, were, uh, we we finished our angle, and then they were going to go to Fox Sports Net, and initially they just wanted to sign Bobby just because I think they knew the potential they had with Bobby. And then, like, uh, I think a week later, Scott called me and was like, yeah, they want to sign all you guys because they want to keep going with Team Canada. And But, like, right then there you knew, like, Bobby was the one that, you know that they they had they had plans for, yeah. And then you know some some, and then Eric Young ended up blowing up. I mean that that came out of the blue. Um, he started doing that gimmick where he was afraid of everything, and that caught on. And they started pushing him, and then, you know, he got his own TV show on Animal Planet and all that stuff. So I mean, you know, some some things you don't plan for and just happen, and some things you plan for and, you know, they happen. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, no problem at all, man. Uh, you know, you brought up EY. Um, you, before we move on, I mean, look, the, the thing with Eric Young, I, I think when uh, what was his last year in uh, TNA was, what, 2015? When he was doing that world-class maniac gimmick, I honestly thought, like, that was the best heel work in wrestling at the time. Uh, and, and, you know, EY's always done good, and he's always been funny. I mean, did you see – could you see that in EY, you know, like the, the just monster heel and the great work he was doing there? Did you, did you see that in him, or was he just kind of always that humorous guy? No, no, he, he, he could definitely do that. Cause he's done it. Like I've known him for like, like 17 years. Like we, uh, he was one of my first, not one of my first matches, but I, I worked them like in my first, like, like month or so of, 
like actually doing wrestling shows and stuff like that and like i, I looked up to him and all that stuff he was like a great talent and he could he could do that heel stuff like I, I knew his potential and so when they brought him to team canada and he was just kind of that guy that took a crazy bump every team canada match like i'm like yeah that's not that's not re-. like i mean he could do that but that's not all he can do i mean he's so much more and uh um you know i it, eventually he just got to show it so i knew he could do all that stuff and he could do it great and uh you know I, i'm glad that everybody else saw it too i did too i mean i guess i'm a little disappointed that uh someone at the, the at the e saw it but because i miss him in in tna gfw a lot but uh you know i guess backtracking a little bit pd here um you know you left what was it 2009 when you left uh tna the first time around yep so, I mean, back then, I mean, what, what made you leave wrestling and, you know, what did you end up doing once you left wrestling at the time or left well, TNA at least? Um, well, I did like, uh, did a lot of indie shows to start off with and then Demore got me hooked up with all Japan and I did a few tours over there and then I, uh, did, a, a bunch of shows for ring of honor for a while. So I was just kind of like freelancing and doing stuff like that. And then, um, uh, you know, they called me back in 2013 um, and I didn't like how they called me back, so it was kind of just like, you know, we're backstage, and oh, look at Petey Williams is returning, you know, and that was it. I'm like, really, dude? I've been gone for four years, and you're just going to be like, oh, Petey Williams is back. So, I mean, that's one thing I didn't want to happen this next time I came back. I said, let's make it more of a big deal, and I, I thought they did a good job with it. You know, I was actually like a surprise return and stuff like that, and all that kind of stuff. So I just did a lot of freelance stuff until 2014. Then I said, you know what? I said that, that that's it. You know, I said I had a good career. Um, I'm going to get out of the wrestling business. And I did. And I did for three years. I didn't even step foot back in a wrestling ring. Um, sometimes when like ring of honor was in town, when I knew like the machine guns would be around and Jay lethal and stuff, you know, I'd stop by to say hi. Um, but it was just like maybe 20 minutes from my house. And um, and then I got a message from Damore one day asking, you know, how things were going and stuff. And this is February 2017 this year. And I said, great, can't complain, love and life. And he kind of said, hey, you know, uh, your name gets brought up at TNA. Uh, they're interested in having you back. And I said, absolutely not interested sorry i said i don't want to go back and he you know he's he's pushing a little bit more and i said you know i'm content if i never wrestle again i said i said i think i'm good with it i think i had a good career i, I did what i did I had a move that'll last forever um i said i'm good and then he brought up the fact that uh he's like well you know maybe i thought you know you got you what three kids now he said you know maybe you know, your, your kids might want to see what their dad used to do. And I'm like, you asshole. I'm like, you are such a... And that's what kind of brought me back into it. Um, I mean, that's all it took. And, you know, I asked my wife. My wife was my biggest fan. She was like, yeah. She's like, do it. Go back. I'm like, all right, wait, hold on. Are you sure? She's like, yeah, do it. Yeah, this would be awesome. Well, and so I'm like, all right. So, I mean, that's how I got right back into it after I thought I got out clean. Um, it always sucks you back in, you know, and I, I did miss it uh, a lot. I did miss it, but I was totally content on not having to wrestle again, probably because, uh, my body hurts so much right now and it didn't hurt as much when I was wrestling so or when I have, wasn't wrestling. We have your wife and your kids to thank for this. Yeah. And your, Dennis your, <laughs> and, 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 and Dennis and Scott Demore. But I mean, honestly, it was, it was you trying to show your kids what daddy can do. And your wife, frankly, frankly, Peter, just went you out of the house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what pretty much what it is. She's like, I want you gone. You know, you, 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 <laughs> you suck being around all weekends and stuff like that. And um, I, I need you to go wrestle on weekends and stuff. But um, no, I mean, she's super supportive. I mean, I couldn't ask for more. So, um, yeah, and my kids, I did. I did uh, uh, before I went back to TNA, I think I had like three matches to just kind of get me ready. And one of them. Um, I, I had a local show and she was a, actually able to bring, bring my, uh, uh, my, well, my one's only one year, one year old. Um, well, he turns one tomorrow, but oh, wow. Happy uh, birthday. yeah. And then, uh, my other ones are three and the other one will almost be seven. So like 
three and seven. They're four years apart, and they came to the show, and it was the first time they actually got to wrestle me or watch me wrestle live, and uh, that, that was that was that was really special. So, you know, and obviously they call me daddy, but my wife was like, you know, this is the day you could say go PD go go PD go, <laughs> you know, so you could call him PD. It's fine. So, um, yeah, my seven year old always asks about it, like, how'd you get that scar right there? I'm like, well, I used to do this thing called wrestling, and I might, sh- I think I showed her one of my matches, and she was like, what? Like, you know, like, I think she was blown away by it because she sees, she'll see wrestling on TV, and then I actually did that, and uh, I don't know if she could comprehend it. Like, oh, every dad does re- professional wrestling, right? <laughs> like, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the norm, right? So Everybody's yeah. daddy does a Canadian destroyer. Yeah, I guess so. Not, not in my house. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. So, you know, just aside from, you know, showing your kids what dad's all about and what dad does and, and let's face it, what, what makes you so special in the ring, PD, what else would you like to see yourself accomplish in GFW this time? Uh, well, what's awesome, uh, and this is for real, I keep joking with, San- like, you know, obviously Sanjay and I are, are like very close friends. Um, and he like is on the creative team now, so I'll joke with him. I don't want to get too into detail, but I'll say like, uh, since we teamed up once, I'm like, Hey, uh, so when are we winning those tag titles? You know? And I'm like, dude, I'd love to be a tag champion. I mean, I was in team Canada for the longest time, like a group. And I'm like, I never got to, you know, win the tag titles. I'm like, that's, I'm like, that's ridiculous. So, uh, that that'd be one of my goals is to win the tag titles, and I'd like to either do it with Sanjay or Scott Steiner. I mean, that'd be great, right? Scott Steiner back, yeah. Um, and uh, another one would be I would love to come back and win the X Division Championship like 13 years after I won I won my first one. I mean, that's got to be some sort of TNA record, right? Between championships, well, yeah. I, I won my other one in. 2008 but still i mean that's pretty far like nine nine years between championships so we're four eight and 17 yeah you you missed one you need no, to come only, back I, and win it in 2012 if i'm if I, i'm working this right or 13 i i know i didn't win the belt i only i'm only two times two i know i'm saying i'm saying but if, if you did it every four or five years you'd have had one in the middle yeah we need, we need to blame somebody for that yeah i'm, I mean, I'm I, gonna blame hogan and bischoff because i think that was probably their time yeah, and I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I I went for the X division. I, I was in a title match one, uh, once, maybe twice. I don't know. And then I, I do hold a record with TNA. I was the first ever non-American to win a singles title in TNA history. First ever non-American. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah. Give me that one. It, it, well, I I, I I I mean, the history wasn't long. We were only around for like two years. <laughs> 2002 you know so i mean and it happened in 2004 so and it wasn't bret hart either raven effect it was yeah. it, it wasn't was bret hart and I, damn well shouldn't have been it should have been pd that's right I, I gotta tell you something pd i i love the concept of you and sanjay as a tag team or i mean obviously you and steiner are the tag team i mean that's just that's puts a smile all over my face uh, honestly we, we need we need to get that one booked i don't know who's in creative anymore i don't know who's running that particular show it seems to be changing weekly but uh big john i think it's you these, these days if you're listening let's get this thing booked let's get scott steiner and pd williams in the tag team division and, and lax is going to have a serious problem on their hands it'd be good to team with scotty i just know i would do all the work um which kind <laughs> of sucks um with, with sanjay he'd at least split the work with me so i mean i you know i wouldn't mind e- either one would be fine maybe we'll have like the free birds rule where all three of us are together that'd be even better i think I, i'm not sure that 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 scotty and sanjay really go together and they're kind of like oil and water there yeah, no, they would never go together. But I think yeah. they're, they're, com- they're common denominator if we're talking math right now. So Scott, yeah. Scotty would buy it, yeah. We could get Truth Martini to manage the three of you. Now, oh, that I'd... would be hysterical. Let's get Truth in there. Why not? Yeah, I, love, you know, I love Truth Martini. We got to get him out there. Yeah, I mean, I haven't. I, I went to his school. I think uh, when I got back into wrestling, I think I did – uh, three training sessions for like 20 minutes a piece just to get like some footwork back to some chain wrestling. One was over at the Moore school and the other two were at truth school. 
and Truth wasn't even there. I don't even think he should, like he shows up at the school anymore. So uh, I, I can't find him. Where's Truth? I don't know. If you know where he's at, you know, let me know. You, you know, um, it's kind of ties into something I actually plan on asking you about. But you know, you mentioned uh, 2013 when you came back and how you didn't like the way that they went about that. And truthfully, uh, as a fan at that time who was excited about your return. I actually felt the same way, and I didn't think they kind of did it justice. But um, look, if I remember, there's only like a couple TV appearances, but you did you did work some one night onlys with the tag team with Sanjay. Um, it, that that's correct, right? That's kind of like the main stuff that you did back then. Yes, that's right. Um, so, yeah. Oh no, go ahead, please. No, yeah, we did. I remember we did one tag match. It was actually one of my favorites too. Uh, it was myself and Sanjay. It was a one night only pay per view, and. Um, Myself and Sanjay against the Young Bucks. And, man, we did everything in that match. We were, like, just planning it. And then uh, I can't remember. Uh, what was it? I, I, don't, I don't remember which Young Buck was. Uh, he was like, you know what? Screw it. Let's do this, too. We just did, like, everything we could possibly do in, like, a 12-minute match, 12, 15-minute match. And it was awesome. I mean, it was it was great. I mean, the crowd, I mean, it was a it was a – um, there wasn't a big crowd there and they've already seen a bunch of wrestling because we were filming so much, but man, I love that match. Loved it. Yeah, and, um, so if, I, if, and I remember I too, you guys, uh, wrestled bad influence too. Oh yeah. That was my big, my big return. Yeah. So before I came back to impact, that was like me coming back to TNA and, uh, yeah, you know, got the welcome back chant and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, we did the good old, uh, um, and me, myself and Christopher Daniels did this like all the time at, at, uh, at house shows and stuff like that. Say if he was going over, if I was going over, I would hit the destroyer. If he was going over, you know, he would hit me with whatever he did to do the finish. And then afterwards he would kind of like, you know, after he'd celebrate, he'd go over me and like kind of start kicking me or beating me up again. And then he'd pick me up and then I'd break his hands and do the destroyer at the end. Right. To kind of send the crowd home happy. So Daniels was good like that. And, uh, so what we did the one night only, uh, pay-per-view it was me and Sanjay against bad influence. They went over. And then afterwards, I think like Daniels and Frankie were about to beat me up. And I did the whole, like, you know, he was holding me and I did the whole move. He like Buddha doomed him or something like that. Turned into the destroyer. You know, things that we were doing back in, like, 2006. So, um, yeah, I, had a bla- I always have a blast working that. Always. Any of those guys from that era, I mean, that was, like, all, all those guys. My, my favorite opponents. Yeah, yeah I, I'll be honest. I bought that one on DVD, the, that, that event, strictly because I wanted to see that match so bad. And, uh, you know, we, we talked earlier. So, look, if, uh, and this is going to be proof in the pudding, if the old TNA Asylum.net or whatever – uh, like I, I did back in the days, kind of write some uh, ideas that I had in TNA. And one thing that's in there that people will see in there is I was like preaching and beating the table to try and get the team of PD Williams and Sanjay Dutt back into uh, TNA. And, uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned that you want to see the tag team titles or, you know, get a tag team championship run with Sanjay. Um, I mean, is that, do you think that might be something that's actually going to happen here? I mean, do you think it's being pitched or something we could possibly see? Because I think. As great as you guys are in the X Division, man, I want to see this as a tag team. I think you guys in LAX, man, would just tear it down. No, I, I agree with you. It, realistically, with the way things are going, I think it's less likely now. With with Jeff leaving, and then a lot of the booking responsibilities are now falling on. I know you said Big John, but I, I think they're actually falling on Scott and Sanjay. I think Sanjay's going to have his hands full, and this is all this is all speculation. I don't know what's going to happen with Sanjay and his character, but if I had to guess, because you'll be so overwhelmed with like create, creative and all that kind of stuff, that I think you'll see him like take a step back out of the role as a as a wrestler and more of like oh, I'm going to do creative stuff because I have to focus on that. Because I mean, I, I watched him at the last set of TV tapings. I mean, that guy is a machine. Like he'd have to wrestle two matches in that one night. Like we filming like a two and a half hour to three hour time span. And he'd have to like, soon as he was done his match, like he, he wouldn't even dry off. He would just go right back to the grill area, put on the headset or set up the next angle and get this film over here. And okay, let's shoot this over here. Oh, my, my match is up next. Okay. Take off the headset, go up there, do his match. Come like, he's just a, a maniac. And then after the show, he's writing more of the show and all that. So I could see him wanting to take a step back. 
and, and not do as much of an active wrestler's role. Um, but I mean, that'd be good. Cause we'll, what better would be to put him in a tag team where he doesn't have to wrestle as much cause he has somebody to share the work with. So I, I don't see it happening. It's less likely now that Jeff's gone, but who knows? This is professional wrestling. Anything could happen. Are you uh, proud of proud to see Sanjay you know, winning the X Division, um, the X Division title after all this time? Yeah, I'm proud of him because I mean he he never got to win it back, you know, in, in the X Division glory days. So, um, yeah, and and he won it in India, I believe, like in front of his own people. Yeah, it was pretty definitely much. a great so, stage to win that in India. Yeah, that yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, so I, I'm glad. Did he win it once or did he win it twice or no? Yeah. He only won it once, right? Yeah, because the Trevor Lee stole it from him. Yeah, okay. So yeah, one time exhibition that. champion. Yeah, now he can retire and go in the TNA Hall of Fame and all that stuff as the champion. Great, love it. So what? What kept him from winning it back back in the day? And they just, you know, I mean, they had a lot of talent that they were pushing over. You know, Sanjay. I mean, it just it was what it was. I don't know if they like. He, he was always a great hand. Like, if you look at anybody that came in the company, like, look at Samoa Joe when he first came in. Who did he wrestle? He wrestled Sanjay. Sanjay had to put him over. Anybody that used to come in, it was like, Sanjay's going to make this guy look good. So sometimes, like, when you're that good of a wrestler, it kind of sucks because you can always make people look good. So you're always, like, that stepping stone, um, which always sucked for Sanjay um, just because he's so good and you can do anything. Um, so I'm just glad that he was able to finally get that X division championship that he's been working for, for like, I don't know, whatever, since 2004, three, maybe if he was there before me. It kind of reminds me a lot of, uh, James storm, right? James storm's always putting somebody over and unfortunately not getting to go over as much as we'd like to see him go over at the same time. Uh, yeah, but I remember back in, I mean, he got his, he got his due, like he was always in the tag team with America's Most Wanted and then come 2000, I think eight, I started feuding with him. Uh, I was the guy that put him over for his first singles push. Um, and I feuded with him for a little bit and then he went on and I, I think within like a couple of years he won, he won the title, right? Like in maybe 2010 or something like that. Yeah. So he I mean, had it for about six days or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Billy it, it was pretty bad. So, you know, he, he, he got it. He at least got it. So um, that's good. But, I mean, he's another guy that's been there, you know, since since the beginning pretty much. So um, it's always good to see guys that could have that long of a career in one company. Um, that's, that's pretty special. You don't see that a lot anymore. So we were talking about titles before. Um, what's your thoughts on the, the Impact Brand title format? And would you, would you like to see yourself in that picture? Um, I'd like to, I'd like to try it, um, just to say I've, I've, I've tried it. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm huge on that concept, um, because, so like, sometimes you gotta. I understand what they're trying to do, like in the old British days where they had rounds and stuff like that. Um, but sometimes, like wrestling has evolved so much, and like the fast paced action that you, you got that you see nowadays on on television. And, you know, you wrestle for, you know, so many minutes and then you got to stop because the bell rings because now there's a round. So you got to kind of bring the crowd back into it. Maybe you were just starting to get steam. And that's what it seems like every at the end of every round. It's kind of like a drama type. And, and so that that kind of sucks because I think it kind of, you know, it takes the crowd out of it a little bit. Um, but I think it's a good concept at the same time. I just I'm trying to think of what they can add to it to make it mean a little bit more. Um, but yeah, no, that's a good question. I'm not. I'm a big fan of the concept. I just I, I wish they had a little, something more with it. I don't know what it is though, but I wish they had something more with it. Yeah, I think when they came back, when Dutch and everyone came back and Scott, they were all talking about it online that they wanted to like tweak it a bit. And I think the fans are all for it too. Um, is that the consensus in the back too with the guys there? They're okay with the format, but they would like it changed. I I think so, and I I think like one of the biggest problems with it is that, you know, how do you become the number one contender to the grand champion? Okay, you obviously beat other guys in regular wrestling match, not grand champion style matches. So that's a problem right there. You're not even wrestling that style to earn the number one contender 
of that of that championship belt. So um, maybe if they had more grand champion matches that weren't just for the title, that might mean something. Maybe a little bit different. I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing right here. So, so you know, obviously the grand title format is something that's that's new to the company, at least since you've been back. It obviously started with uh, Billy Corgan. But, you know, talking about the company and how it is today, how's it been like so far working for the new Anthem group compared to the one you worked under when you were in TNA to begin with? I mean, let's face it. You went from having Dixie Carter, who's a very startup-oriented individual, as is Jeff Jarrett, mm-hmm. to having somebody like Ed Nordholm, who's kind of like a hired gun CEO. How does the company run versus how it ran before, and and how do you like it? Um, well, it, it seems like, and this is kind of what got me back to, like when Demore pitched f- to me, saying, "Hey, you should come back. You know, you might like the schedule because it's only like every six weeks or so, so it's a lot of time off." I'm like, "Oh, that's perfect." But, and then he's like, "And here's the guys that are in the office now," and it was all the same guys that were there, like in 2004, min- minus Sanjay. Sanjay's a new addition. Um, and it's a lot of the guys I know, so I feel very comfortable going back into that setting. Um, and you know, Dixie Carter when in two thousand four, even though she like was owned the company, um, she didn't really have a big hand in what was going on. I mean, she kind of transitioned into that in two thousand four, two thousand five. Um, but Jeff still, you know, had the overall say in it. Um, until Dixie got like more knowledgeable in wrestling and stuff like that. And I, I think, um, I, I feel like it's the same. It's just that it feels like with, in the Dixie era, they always wanted to be like, uh, let's get like uh, Kurt angle. Okay. You know, he's hot now cause he just got released. So let's get somebody else that just got released. That, that's what it seemed like they were doing. And in this company in this era now it doesn't seem like they're doing that which is good i mean i I like that they're trying to build their own their own stars which i think that's what any wrestling company should do um so it feels the same but at the same time uh a little bit different i feel very comfortable there now just like i did in 2004 through 9 than i did when i went back in 2012 so yeah i mean it's it's a little bit same but also different that's the best way to describe it. Have you worked uh, directly with Ed Nordholm much, or is he kind of hands off? No, he, he's he's. Well, I, I don't go up with him to him with storylines and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I didn't know who Ed was at first, like like uh, w- what his face looked like, and then you know we had a meeting and stuff like that. So I went up and I introduced myself, and then uh, you know he's Canadian as well. So obviously we both like each other because we're both Canadian. And, uh, you know, we chatted for a while and stuff like that. And then um, I think I was waiting for my ride at the end of the night. And then uh, it might have been the next night. And then his uh, chief uh, financial officer, he pulled him over to the side. And I thought this was cool. And he was like, hey, you know, come over here. He's like, uh, you know, this is our chief financial officer. And then, hey, this is uh, this is the Canadian destroyer here. So, like, it was good that he remembered, you know, the Canadian destroyer and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, he... To me, it seemed like he was in tune with uh, my character, even though he had just met me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how much interaction. I, I, well, I didn't go up to Ed like with anything like, hey, man, what, what do you think about this in my match? Nothing like that. It was more right, like. Right, right. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, but like, he, he's running the company and, mm-hmm. and he's there, right? So, you know. He's still he's still running the company. He's still there. He's still the boss. I suppose that the best way to say it, he's accessible if you need him. It's not like he's just sort of like running around somewhere else and you can't get a hold of him. Or maybe like Hogan was, where he wanted to be a little more accessible than he was. Uh, it sounds like you know you do have interaction with him, which is a good thing, right? I mean, you you want to have interaction with these folks. Yeah, I I was able to see him like pretty much the entire time if I wanted to. But if I wanted to find Ed. Uh, I could find him like he, he was watching the show and all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, he, he seemed pretty laid back to me and he wasn't like trying to direct traffic or anything like that. And I, I think he knows like he's, he hasn't been in the wrestling business before. Um, so I think he's kind of absorbing it all and taking it in and, and learning as he goes. And, you know, that's, <laughs> a, that's what fire. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but I mean, that's what any smart uh, manager or business owner does. You know, they don't just come in and say like, oh, you're doing things my way. No, they're going to feel it out and see how it's running and stuff like that. See what they could improve on. I mean, he's a billionaire for a reason. So, I mean, we should listen to him, right? If, 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 if I learned anything in my career, it's as a manager, you never make any changes in the first 90 days ever. Yeah, no, you that's always true. wait 90 days, you figure out what's going on, and then you start to decide whether or not you want to make a change, but you don't do it, you know, beforehand. Now, yeah. now we talked about, you know, some of the different um, regimes you worked for in TNA, but you also worked for Ring of Honor for a while too, right? Yep. Now, how, how did that compare? I mean, that sounds like a completely different can of worms of what they're trying to accomplish down there. Yeah, so, um, and it's it's always tough transitioning uh i was married to like austin aries for like i feuded with him in ring of honor and he was like the world champion and i wasn't even like on their tv show so i mean i don't think anybody bought i was going to win the world title from him but i feuded with him for for a while i had many matches with him at ring of honor um and they probably put me with him because well you know he's good and i knew him from tna but it always tna has the stigma about them like for the longest time um in like the 2004 2009 i don't know what era but like wwe didn't want to have anything to do with anybody from tna that doesn't work there anymore and ring of honor is the same way it, it was really weird it's not like that now like if you look at a lot of the guys in wwe right now they're former tna guys and you know same thing ring of honor has some former tna guys like motor city machine guns and stuff like that so i mean it's not like that anymore but when i was there that was the stigma so it was hard transitioning to a different company because they always the fans always viewed you as oh that's that's a tna guy you know and you can never really wipe that from your slate so uh it was tough but uh you know the, the fans always reacted well to me and they still uh, like the destroyer so it was good i was able to take it there and people weren't like oh yeah that's that's a tna move no they, they were genuinely happy to see me so i really enjoyed my time uh ring of honor because i got to wrestle some of the guys that I would have, have never gotten to wrestle because they were always in Ring of Honor that I wanted to wrestle that I knew were great workers like uh, like Cesaro and stuff like that um, and Chris Hero and all that. So uh, I'm happy with my time there. I got about 7% left of my battery, and I, I am nowhere near a charger right now. Um, see so what guys want to do one more question? Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, thank you, Pete. Like, um, pick, pick a good know. one. All right. Uh, See, damn, we got two left. Uh, let's see. We gonna go with the. Uh, let's go with the. Look, what's it like in the wrestling in the Impact Zone now, as compared to what uh, the Impact Zone was back when you first started with the company? Um, you know what? It's when we first. Okay, now this is this is a loaded question because when we first started in 2004 in the Impact Zone, like we were fresh down there. I mean, they didn't they didn't have Impact there before. We were just moving down there. And in 2004, that was a hot crowd. Like, you could do anything. Like, they, they, they weren't used to seeing wrestling every week. Um, and it was it, it, it was great. But then, you know, by the time 2009 rolled around, you know, I've been wrestling there for five years in that same arena. Um, they were still into it. And then even when I went back, um, that first night, that Destination X in August... I mean, that was, it still reminded me of like kind of like the 2009 crowd. They were still a hot crowd, but it really burns them out when we have like six days in a row of wrestling. You know, you could tell each day, you know, they're getting a little bit more burnt out, a little bit more burnt out because they watch like three hours of live wrestling each night. Um, so that's the only downfall nowadays when we're doing so many TV tapings in a row. It's great that we get so much time off, but it's... It, it, it's it, it's tough on the crowd and I, I feel for the fans because if i like you know if i was sitting in the crowd and a wrestling fan uh you know, by the fourth show i'd be burnt out too because i'm like man i've been cheering like the first three nights i'm like this is just it's it's too much to process um but it, it seems like the same like I, I i slid in the ring and the people still knew who i was even though it's been so many years and uh if I, I felt very, very comfortable, like the setting, like I knew where all the cameras were still. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I felt super comfortable. Like I was at home when I got back in the ring. 
That is that is awesome, Petey. That is fantastic. Now, look, I know that your battery is about I shot, got, and quite frankly, we're, we're sorry. What? I got I got six percent left now. Six percent, and and, that, and that we're we're out of questions, story. man. <laughs> Right. I mean, honest to God, that that was well, that was an awesome three percent story. In fact, all of your stories are awesome. I mean, you you you've been engaging, you've been captivating. I mean, you know, we're 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 going nuts listening to these stories. It's been absolutely fantastic having you on the show. Uh, can't wait to to see you on Impact this week. Uh, I know you got Bound for Glory coming up, and you're going to be at the next set of tapings. And I believe that your uh, wrestling dates are on your website at wrestlingperspectivepodcast.com. Yes, that is correct. All the upcoming dates that I'm able to announce. Uh, I know some people like to book me as a surprise and stuff like that. So once I find out, like if they advertise my match or if the promoter tells me like you're not a surprise or whatever, um, then I will advertise which shows I will be at. Yes, definitely. That's awesome. And we can find your podcast there. Can we catch you on iTunes and YouTube as well? Um, Yeah, I think we got a link to iTunes on there. Uh, Dennis does all that stuff. I mean, yes. I should probably have him right on here. He, he's he's the tech guy. He's the professional podcaster. All right, I'm just there for show. Yeah, it's definitely on iTunes. That's where I listen. It's definitely on YouTube, guys. Yeah, Google Play. I'm, I'm on Twitter. Uh, all all the links are on there too. My Twitter is IPD Williams. Um, you can find me on there, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. That's awesome. Well, maybe we got to change your uh, Twitter name to A. Petey Williams or Petey oh, Williams A. Man. Why did you uh, think of that? We're bringing, it, we're bringing it all back to where we started from, Petey. Oh, man. I should have <laughs> thought of that. Full circle. <laughs> Everybody, before we lose Petey due to a dead battery, uh, Petey, I want to thank you for being on the HeelCast. For, for the entire HeelCast, in, including my, myself, uh, officially now Impact Dude, uh, Raven Effect, Greg's executive producer, Old School Heel, and the entire cast of Heels. You know, we've got Hurls, we've got Kyle and Chef and FK9, everybody else that joins Robert. us. Robert, don't forget wrestling Robert. That guy is absolute gold. Uh, we thank you for joining us, Petey. We're looking forward to seeing you, catching you at the next tapings, and uh, we'll see you this Thursday night on Impact Wrestling. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome, thank Petey. you so much, Petey. You can't even appreciate our gratitude enough, man. Right. Tear it up ben, for glory, PD. Thank you. It's been our Thanks. pleasure. Take care, buddy. All right. All right. And we are done recording. PD, it's been a total blast having you, man. Oh, th- thanks for having me, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, all right. Well, my battery is uh, seriously about to die. So About to uh, die, buddy. You, all right. Well, you, you guys wore me out on this. My, <laughs> wore my phone out. Wow. <laughs> Well, take care, man. Have a, have a great night, and uh, can't wait to see that Canadian destroyer. And uh, you know, don't forget to to tell Mister Seidel that he needs to slide in the ring for me. All right? Yeah, Seidel's ring entrance. I'll tell him. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, all right. Thank, thanks, buddy. Take care. All right, you, you too, guys. Thanks. All right, bye. All right, see. You.